Welcome to the Arrive Podcast, the U.S. Immigration Law Podcast for Canadians. If you haven't already, check us out. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where we talk about this stuff too. We also have a lot of information on our website. Um, through our resources tab, we have, it's called a blog. I don't know if that's the proper term for it these <laughs> it days. Sounds kind of old fashioned. but It's, but it's kind of like an information resources section on our website for U.S. immigration related questions. A lot of the common immigration questions that we hear that people ask are found on there with with detailed answers and information, you know, direct you to resources that can help you with specific questions. Yeah, And there's always new, um, you know, new blogs being posted weekly. So check it out. Yeah, and you can subscribe on there for those uh, weekly updates. And every week it shoots out an update of the new content on there. So definitely a good resource if you're looking for information on U.S. immigration law and want to st- stay up to date at all. We also has U.S. immigration news that, you know, when USCIS comes out with something new or there's an, a big immigration announcement, we'll post it on there as well. So definitely another place to check out for, for information as well, in addition to listening to us here on the RIVE podcast. So today we will be discussing... Working in the United States as a Canadian, what does that look like? And really addressing one of the common questions that we receive, and that is, I'm Canadian, I want to work in the U.S., do I qualify? And if I qualify, what does that discussion look like with my employer in order to get the proper visa in order to work in the United States? And typically in this situation, we're we're going to be talking about a TN visa. Because most employers, when you get a job offer, they want you to start right away. And that's really the only readily available visa to get within a week or two weeks of a job offer would be the TN visa to be able to go down and work in the United States. There are other visa options, but they're more complex. And most of them require getting pre-authorization with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services before even using them. And some of them, like the H-1B, require a lottery. So it can take a long time to get other visa options. So the TN visa is typically the one that Canadians look at when they're coming to work in the United States right away on a job offer. And uh, we've talked about the TN before, uh, again, because it's the most common work option for a Canadian to come in the United States uh, quickly. And... There are some advantages and disadvantages to to doing that and using the TN visa. Now, typically when you're coming to work in the United States, you're responding to a job ad or you have a job prospect somehow. Maybe you you have a connection in the industry, you've worked in the U.S. before, went to school in the U.S., uh, have a colleague, but you found out about a job. However, however you found out about that job in the United States. And you want to know whether or not the job you've been offered or want to fill in the United States qualifies. Can I go down and work in this job? I think that's really the first question you need to to ask before you go down the path of looking for a work visa in the United States. Is this job that you want to fill in the United States, does it even qualify? Do you even have a chance right. of getting a visa for that job? For yeah, because a lot of jobs, there's, I mean... Unless it's a professional level position, it's going to be very difficult to get a visa for that. And there's going to be um, other aspects that come into play. It's not going to be something that can be done quickly or something that can be done at the border. It's going to be a more lengthy process that's going to involve a lot of work on behalf of the uh, employer themselves. Um, and they may not be interested in doing that. So they don't you know, want to wait. They don't want to, you know, put forth the cost. Right. So know. is this a professional level position that's going to qualify for a TN visa? That's something I can get quickly at the border, come in and start working right away. And s- some positions that you can immediately look at and, and know you're, it's not going to qualify if it's a job in the trades. Right. Trades does not qualify. You're, you're not going to be able to get a visa, unfortunately, for that. And then there's one off jobs that we hear about. On a, on a frequent basis, you know, you're coming down as a job groomer, dog groomer, not job <laughs> That's groomer. a frequent one that you hear. <laughs> yeah, I hear it a lot. Dog groomer, dog we trainer, do need, you dog know, we trainers do need too. Dog groomers here. My dog can't get in to get groomed. I've been waiting over a month for an appointment. Sad. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, but, we need dog groomers, but there's no visa for them. <laughs> they're under the TN, you cannot get a, under TN visa status, it's not available. 
dog trainer not available um and we can keep going on and on about uh jobs where people are trying to come down to fill a profession that's just not listed and unfortunately because the USMCA professions list hasn't been updated uh, a lot of these professions aren't on there but also for good reason a lot of them don't require a specialized training or knowledge or education in order to enter into that profession. So it's one of the ways that the, the U.S. tries to protect the labor market. Similar to Canada, uh, you know, it, the same rules apply for Americans trying to get into Canada, too. You can't just go to Canada and fill any job that you want. Um, there's specific professions. You have to have specific qualifications. So that's the first thing. Is this job that you're looking to fill in the United States – is it even one that a visa is available for? Then if you determine that, you know what, this job is for, and and I'll just give a common one we receive, is for a computer engineer. Okay, it, it that a computer engineer is a professional level occupation, and it is one that qualifies um, under the USMCA for a TN visa status. The second thing is determining whether or not you, in fact, have the right qualifications for that. Even right. if that job is available and it is one that And you qualifies. might be working as a computer engineer in Canada. Um, you may have been doing that for 10, 15, 20 years and still not qualify for a TN to the U.S. because this occupation is going to require you to hold a certain level of education, which you may or may not have. Yes. And maybe your education was outside of North America as well. So you may be qualified in another country, um, but not in North America. So you need to be pay careful attention to the specific qualifications requirements for the visa as well. For example, for if we're talking about a computer engineer, they want you to have an engineering-related degree. It must be closely related to the engineering field for you to qualify. So if you come in and you have a... a a BCom, that's a common one we see. You have a bachelor, mm -hmm. a BCom from Canada, and but you've been working as an engineer in Canada. Unfortunately, that's not going to qualify you. Just pure experience without a closely related degree to computer engineering, you're not going to qualify to work in that position in the United States. And that I think that's a sensitive topic for people, and rightfully so. You can qualify and be a professional in your own right without having this specific cookie cutter yeah, that piece education, of paper, right? right that, yeah. that says that you're qualified. And some of the best in the world don't even have an education, and we understand that. So that's, unfortunately, this is the way that U.S. immigration law is written. Um, so there are people that are very qualified that don't qualify for TN because they don't have the specific delineated qualifications that are under the USMCA. Right. Um, so pay careful attention to that before you get too far down the job interview process and, and, you know, selling your house and making arrangements to go to the United States. You know, is this job one of the proper professions? Do you have those qualifications? Are your qualifications closely related to the specific qualifications that are listed? And then another important thing is, is is the employer in the United States aware of your need to get a visa to work in the U.S.? Right. Yeah, that's a good one because sometimes they're not and you can be interviewing for a position and you understand, you know, you've done some research. The TN only requires a job offer. Some people believe that to apply at the border. Yeah. Uh, once I get my offer, I'm just going to head over there with my diploma and, and make my application. Well, um, that's not necessarily true. So you have to make sure that the employer is on board with this and they are aware that you require some support um, with respect to getting this status in the United States. Um, we've had people hire us before. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, my employer knows all about this. They're going to be they're going to be happy to sign the letter you draft and we create a package for them and they come back and say my employer won't sign the letter. They, they said that they didn't want to they didn't want to sponsor for this position. Um, so it's super important to make sure right off the bat that they're aware you're going to require TN support. Yeah, and, and there's more information on our website to give another plug for resources on there that <laughs> talk about the specific situation. And this is a big one. I think we run into the, this one a lot 
where people get all the way to the end of the interview process. They've got, they've secured that interview. They have that job offer. Now I just need my visa. And then they, you know, call a secret Philly on the side and say, Hey, I need a, I need a visa to work in us. I really didn't tell my employer I needed one. And I told them I already had work authorization when I filled out that job application online. Cause, right, cause I was just going to go to the border and get it once yeah. I, once I got I just, the job I, offer. I have that job offer it talked about and that's all I need. Right. I'm good to go. Right. Yeah. Well, now that brings up another question. What's the difference between an offer letter and a support letter? And there's a big difference when it comes to applying for a TN visa at a port of entry or by mail with USCIS. An offer letter is very different than a support letter. Offer letters typically will be addressed, for example, to the employee. This offer is made to John Doe for the position of and this is this is where an offer letter differs, I think, a lot from a support letter. The position that is awfully often listed in an offer letter is some internal title mm -hmm. that that doesn't line up with the profession, yeah. even though it might be. And oftentimes it does fall under one of the professions. But the title that they use is an internal job title that's not it readily identifiable yeah, it as help a profession. The border officer to understand under how you qualify. So. It could cause an issue. It doesn't. And typically a job offer letter isn't going to list detailed duties that are that an officer is able to determine whether or not the duties being performed fit under or, a profession. Even if it does list duties, a lot of times when I see these letters, um, they're not written in layman's terms. They're specific to the industry. There's a lot of acronyms which people can't understand. Or in some cases, they're not duties at all. They're yes. like... Um, requirements usually is what not, they talk about. I mean, yeah, like not even requirements. Sometimes they'll be, be like to, knowledge of yes. uh, Microsoft Word. That's not a duty. That's like, <laughs> likes pets. Right. And works well, <laughs> well with others. Well, you know what I mean. There's, yes. you know, these job it doesn't offers, give enough information. That's their for, internal information yes. for the company that they are telling the people in the company what their their new hire needs to have in order to be able to do the job not necessarily a list of duties that that new hire is going to do once they're in the position. Yeah, what to expect when you get when you work for us, right? You're going to get these benefits. You're, this this is what our, you know, you know work high environment energy, looks like. You know, yes. Top-notch sales performance that these are not duties. And if it, and then it may have a start date on there, but it often won't determine a time frame, which is important for for at the end, they need to know how long they need to issue this visa for. And employers, you know, might be a little leery of that because, mm -hmm. oh, wait, is this, this, we don't, we're not giving you a contract. This is an employment contract. Um, but the point is, is that offer letter and a support letter vary in the information. And I shouldn't say very differ in the information that they contain. Right. An and offer I, letter has really a, detailed offer letters that have a lot of information in them. Um, and sometimes the level of information really is too much. So you can go in the other direction where you're, yes. you have too much information and the officer can't, they don't have time to wade through it all and pick out the important stuff that they need. So you want to make sure you have a specific TN support letter, not just an offer letter when you go to the border. In fact, we've heard officers um, who deny people TNs because the offer letter or support letter wasn't addressed to the border yes um they said this letter isn't addressed to me this is addressed to you so this isn't a tn how do letter. i know your employer even knows you need a tn right they want to know that your employer is fully aware mm -hmm. that you need tn visa status to work in the united states right and the letter that they accept um should be addressed to the border and it, it lets the border know hey we need John Doe to come to work in the United States as a computer engineer from this state to this date. We're going to offer him this wage. These are the duties that John's going to perform. Um, you know, please issue him a, a, a TNV for this temporary time period. And the tough part is a lot of times when we get these calls, people have already been to the border with these offer letters. Um, they've already made an application and they call us after the fact to say, oh, by the way, I've already tried to apply at the bridge and I was denied. Here's the offer letter I used. And we take one quick look at it and we know this person's not going to be able to apply again because that offer letter uh, somehow provided information to indicate that the job may not be actually in the field they're wanted to apply in or has information contrary to what would 
the officer would be allowed to approve a TN for. So, and it creates a record. So be careful. Yeah, they have a copy of it. So next time you go back, they're going to be looking at that offer letter. And if it looks any different, um, you know, they're going to say, were you lying now? Or were you lying when you showed up earlier? Yeah, you get flagged for fraud for <laughs> so, just telling them what you need to do to get a visa. Exactly. So, you know, sometimes you are limiting your options when you just make an attempt like that. It's not, it's not something that you can just try and hope for the best. You want to make sure that first impression is one that's going to be your best chance of approval. Yes, and that that's another important uh, thing to keep in mind. It creates a permanent record. This never goes away, ever. It may become inconsequential years down the road, and you know it's not going to hamper your ability to cross the border, but it it's permanent in the system. Mm-hmm. And if you go to another port because you are denied in, let's say, Buffalo, and you want to go to Lewiston, Queenston, well, they, they're going to be able to pull up quickly in the system and see that you were refused entry in Buffalo. And they're going to see the notes that the officer left. They may even have put in a copy of the letter you used. Those officers put a lot of details in there. Mm-hmm. They may tell you, you know, very few, give you very little feedback and say, oh, don't worry about it. Just come back with the right stuff. Well, be careful. Um, Because you may not even be able to come back with the right stuff. Like you said, you may have already disclosed so much information or applied in a completely incorrect category that that can't be overcome. Whereas if you would have done it ahead of time and prepared properly, then the position might qualify for a TM profession if if positioned properly. Uh, And that there's a lot of factors that go into that. Right. Right. is it a managerial position or not? How much management can you actually do while you're on a TN? You know, sometimes they'll disclose, you know what, I'm coming to work for this employer and then they're going to sponsor me for a green card, right? Which, can they do it? Sure. But your intent at the entry to the United States on a TN can't be to do that. Can it be at a later date? Sure. You can have future intent for something, but not immediate intent. Um and then the duties that you're performing, the title that's listed. Even the compensation you receive and the way you receive it can can affect the the ability to get approved for I'm a TN. I'm only getting stock so, options. I mean, we, yeah, and we've had conversations with employers before, like, hey, you're hiring this guy on a TN. He can't, you know, in this type of a position, you can't compensate them this way. Commission and only. You know, if they're, they want to hire you, they'll change that sometimes. And they'll say, okay, well, we want to stay within the bounds of what this visa is, you know, for this person. And they'll change change around whatever they need to do. We've got gotten people raises before. Yeah. <laughs> I had a hotel manager um, who was fresh out of school. He definitely qualified for a TN. Um, and we had to talk to his employer and say, listen, in, in Miami Beach, uh, you know, this is what a hotel manager is going to be expected to make. And if you if you say you're going to be compensating this person at this low wage, you know, at that point, they're going to consider it not to be a professional level position. They're going to think he's, you know, uh, working in housekeeping or something. So we ended up getting that employee a raise uh, and the employer was was on board with it and didn't have a problem with that because they knew they understood that the visa required it and they met the requirements. And that brings up the next uh, topic, and that's looking at this from, I guess, from the Goodyear blimp view. You're looking, you have to take all factors into consider into consideration when you're doing this type mm-hmm. of application. And you just raised, where are you working? You said hotel, right? Well, we've seen, and here's an example, um, and this was, you know, not not too long ago. Somebody called up and said, Oh, I'm I'm going to go work for a hotel as an accountant. <clears throat> I'm like, okay. Um, what are your qualifications? I had all the right qualifications. Actual accountant I had a degree. Um, I'm like, well, how many people work at the hotel? Oh, there's the owner and three employees. <laughs> and they needed a full time accountant for that. No, they don't. So when an officer looks at that type of application, you say you're coming in to work as an accountant for a, a hotel that may only have a few or employees any ty- yeah, any type of or business, a gas that's station. That's another one we've run into or right. any type of business. Yeah, any type of business. It doesn't got, matter. Yeah, it's got Air a low salon. number of em- employees and maybe, you know, a low revenue stream. Uh, they're not going to need a full time accountant so that the, the story doesn't make sense. The, the big picture of what you're, you're coming doing in to manage. You're isn't not making coming sense. So the officers are very in tune with this and they can look at the business. They pull up information on these employers that you may not even know. 
Um, they have access to that through their online system. Um, and, and they're looking for this to make, make sense to them. So if you're coming in as an accountant, they want to see that there's, you know, a need for your position in the business. Otherwise, they're going to assume you're doing something else. And we've done accountant. I did an account recently for a, a hotel company. But guess what? They have multiple hotels mm-hmm. and hundreds of employees. Okay, right. now you can make the argument that you, you need an accountant for that type of a role. Uh, so a small mop op location saying they need an accountant. Sure, we use an accountant, <laughs> but yeah. we don't use, we definitely don't have a full time accountant for what we do. We have a bookkeeper that's not even full time. Right. So to justify that with that small number of employees, an officer is not, you, not going to fall for that. Right. Um, there's no way. And in reality, what is that person doing? Well, they're probably managing that gas station or that hotel. Yeah, and we see this a lot with management consultant too. People who are qualified, maybe they have a business degree or an MBA and they want to come in and work in the U.S. and they say, oh, I'm just going to apply in the management consultant category. It matches up with my degree. I'm qualified. Um, But it's, you know, a project manager position. But really, I'm going to be advising on this. Um, The officers look at the business that you're coming in to work for. Does this business employ management consultants? Are they a consulting company? If not, you might have a difficult time making that argument um, and helping an officer to understand why your business is hiring you as a management consultant when they're not a consulting company and they don't have any consultants on staff. Yeah, or you're working for a Canadian consulting company sending you to service a contract in the U.S. Yeah. Or maybe you're an independent. Which is a different story. That's a different situation and a scenario that would make sense, right? So you have to be very careful and you understand the profession that you're applying under and the nuances of that specific profession. Yeah, And and management consultant is one of the more difficult ones. Right. And does your employer hire those types of people? You know, and sometimes we've even heard where the border officer is asking um, to see a, um, a job ad. Yep. for the position that you're you're coming in to work for because they know and how did you find out about this job did you apply online did you know show us that job posting yeah and i recently heard an officer asking for one for someone who's coming back for the same job which didn't make any sense because <laughs> yeah, why I would they advertise too. for a position that they've already got someone in but um sometimes they want to see that and does it make sense to show them that is there one available even or did you get this offer of somehow yeah, yeah. How did through you your connections um you know, that whole scenario needs to be understood before you go to the border so that you can properly explain it to the officer. Um, and you don't want to, mi- you know, misconstrue anything or misrepresent anything in your position. But at the same time, um, if you are asked for a job ad and then you just say, I don't have one, that's a reason they can say, OK, come back tomorrow when you do. Yeah. Um, At least have an answer. Yeah, have an answer and, and help, to explain you know, it. working with an immigration attorney will help you be able to position that better and yeah. understand it. Yeah. Important. So that that high level view is very important mm-hmm. and, and officers look at it. And if you're not looking at it that way, then you can miss something um, where we'd be able to identify a potential issue. Uh, with these types of employment arrangements and which ones might qualify and which ones don't qualify. Um, So very important to take all of those factors into consideration uh, and definitely don't, you know, as the saying says, don't put the cart before the horse. Uh, These are all things that need to be done ahead of time before you even show up at that port of entry, before you show up at Pearson pre-flight inspection. If you haven't already done this review, if you haven't talked it through uh, with with somebody who understands the qualifications, if you haven't talked it through with your potential employer, got their buy off. Your friend isn't the best resource because we get a lot of people call and say, well, my friend did this and my friend did that. But your friend may have different educational qualifications, a different employer, a different occupation. Different set of facts. These facts are very specific and they're very um, unique to each individual. So you're best off having someone review your specific situation before you go and uh, possibly make a mistake of that nature. And one of the scenarios we're seeing more and more frequently, and we have throughout COVID, is um, people that have been approved in the past, and oh, they yeah, say, "I've worked for this employer." You know, I've had three so TNs for this employer in the past. Yeah, and then they show up, and they then they get denied um, because the officer says, "Oh, you don't qualify." Unfortunately, you shouldn't have been approved in the past, and we're not approving you now. 
I just had a That's call. That's a shock last. when people hear that after they've worked for an employer for, you know, three, six, nine years, and then they go back to get, you know, they, they've established roots in that area. Um, and the expectation is that you would be approved. You know, it's happened three times before, uh, but there's no guarantees. Or even just, you know, reusing old paperwork. And mm-hmm. you see that a lot. Oh, I used this in the past. I just went back with the same paperwork and they refused me this time. You may qualify. Paperwork may be need to be reworked, though. Yeah, and updated. you may have missed something in that paperwork, sure. you know, that that needs to be adjusted before you reapply. So don't fall into that trap either. Don't assume just because you had a TN in the past that you're just going to get one in the future. Don't, you're relying on old paperwork is a common mistake we see people use. Um, or templates online. I've said people people have pulled letters offline and, and said, oh, I just use this letter, I, the template I found on a TN website and I used it and I customized it for me. That's not the way to go. Yeah. These, these applications are so unique, so specific to each individual, to each job offer, to each employer, to each situation. It's, it's very important to do your due diligence and make sure that you review these things before you just show up at a port of entry and create, well, especially a if record. you like traveling to the U S yeah. right. Because um, well, that's another you know, one mistake in, in, in this arena. And you can prevent yourself from getting to travel even recreationally to the U.S. Because now the officers are on alert. You've uh, made an application for a job in the U.S. You wanted to come in and work. You show up in a few weeks later and say, OK, now I'm going on vacation. They might say, uh, we have a note here that you're trying to come into work and we kind of don't believe you. You got your laptop with you. I'm sorry. You're not coming in. Yep. So. You know, this has implications beyond just this one job opportunity as implications for your future travel. So it's worthwhile to to make the effort up front um, to make sure it's done correctly. Yes, it creates that record and it impacts any travel to the U.S. Whether you whether you want to go down to work for this person or not, whether you're going to Disneyland, it, it's in there. People ask that all the time. Well, I was refused, but this won't impact me in the future. Yes, it will. Um, is it going to prevent you? You know, it all maybe, depends maybe on how you handle yeah. it, right? You may be required to carry extensive documentation with you next time to prove you're not working mm-hmm. or go back with the proper documentation to prove that you are working and you qualify and right. so you can get the right visa. But yes, um, something that people take for granted, especially Canadians coming to the U.S. because it is so easy to travel here as a Canadian if you have a passport. You know, it's often a smile. You and travel wave. and stay. I mean, six months out of any twelve-month period, you can come and stay in the United States. Um, you know, in a visa exempt status. I mean, there's no other country in the world that gets that benefit. Um, and we do, as Canadians, we do have a tendency to take that for granted and and think, oh well, I can do this and I can do that. Well, it's not a can. It's a you may be able to if you're admitted. Yeah, and and if you mess it up, you can lose that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So so be careful. Um, do your due diligence. Make sure that before you accept a job offer in the United States, that you've you've gone through the process. You've you've looked at the the position. Make sure it qualifies. Make sure you qualify. Make sure the company is itself is going to qualify. Is going to give you the evidence you need to make an application. And then they're willing to support you and make mm-hmm. modifications. And I don't. I, the percentage of times that we have to make modifications to an offer letter to make it comply with what's required at a port of entry is extremely high. It's, um, I would almost say every time. Yeah. I'd say maybe I've seen. Yeah. I would say it's a hundred percent. We, we, unless there's always somebody something in the that past. we can, in, that we can change yeah. in, in the way it's done to improve your chances. And unless somebody has been employed in, they've employed people on a TN in the past, chances are there's going to be significant modifications. But even if they've employed people in the past, they could be referring to the... Find out how long ago in the past it was, right? Yeah, they're referring to an old (laughs) INS that hasn't existed in decades. You know, they they could have old terminology in there. Yeah. So you need to be careful. Um, And they may have had a lawyer. So we've seen letters that clearly were prepared by attorneys um, in the past, maybe for the same employer for a different uh, a different applicant, and they kind of tweaked it and customized it for this applicant. But typically, um, there's something that's going to be in there that can be or should be changed to improve your chances for approval, um, especially if it was more than a year ago. I would say you definitely need to get um, a new set of eyes on this. Yeah, you should. All, but in my opinion, and this might be biased, anytime you, anytime before you seek entry to the United States, you should be 
requesting somebody to review and look it over to make sure it's in line to make sure that what you have is the proper at a minimum, right? Yeah. At a minimum. Sometimes we look at these and they're like a dog's breakfast and we got to <laughs> rework the whole letter because, you know, the application itself was just so lacking in information or had way too much information in there. Um, sometimes we've seen people go to the border with packages that are like, I don't know, they've got stacks of paper, they've got a, um, a form in there that, you pages. know, that's not required. A DS-160, and a G28. Yeah, like, it's like overkill. I don't know where they on. get the idea that they need all this information in there, but um, we, we can definitely help pare it down to make sure that your application has the best chance. Yeah, so before you before you accept a job offer in the United States, do your due diligence, not only on yourself and your qualifications, but also on the employer and the opportunity. Everything needs to line up. Mm -hmm. um, so three, three suggestions we have for you before we let you go. Three suggestions before you come to work in the United States. The first one, verify um, that the job that you've been offered qualifies that it qualifies on the for, TN list of occupations. Yep. It's one of the professions and it's one that you're able to get a, a visa for. So verify that that, that it meets the qualifications. It's a, that is a actual occupation under the TN profession. And that the other part of that, the qualifications part is that you hold the qualifications for that occupation as well. Yes. So a double there, double the mm -hmm. position and you both qualify. Um, the second, make sure you disclose your full disclosure to your potential employer. I'm Canadian. Although, although I don't need sponsorship through the department of labor and a petition with us citizenship and immigration services to do this, I do need your support, which I think is very different than sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I do need your support, um, to draft a proper support letter to, present at a port of entry i will apply on my own you don't need to go for me i do this in person it can be obtained rather quickly but i do need you to support me in that process so that i can get my visa to go work for you and mm -hmm. that's very important on how you position it you don't they don't need to you know do a test of the labor market they don't need to do any of these steps um, it's simply a properly drafted letter on their letterhead addressed to the port of entry that you can use to apply on your own to obtain that status. Um, and then verify that they're willing to support you in that process. If the employer isn't willing to make modifications at all, and they said, you know what, this job offer is the only thing we're mm, going to no, give I've you, seen that a lot. and we're not yeah. going to do anything else. Right. Tough luck. If you can't get it with that, well, we can't employ you. That might not that be the best the position for you. Yeah. If that's if that's the way the employer is um, acting surrounding the TN, that means they're not supporting hiring a Canadian on a TN status and, you know, time to look elsewhere for a position. And that's one of the things that I say and I stress before somebody will say, we want to hire you, we want to hire you, please help me get my TN. Mm -hmm. I stress, does your employer know you need a TN? Oh, yeah, they do. Are they willing to, to provide up, yeah. whatever support that you need in order to provide the proper support letter or port of entry. Mm -hmm. you, and I stress and want them to verify and make it clear to them before we retain or start any process for them that they have to do that due diligence to make sure that that employer understands the process and is willing to, to support them in that. Otherwise, we don't even go down that path. Um, and there are a lot that will say, no, this is the offer letter. That's it. Right. No modifications. If you can't get it with that, then unfortunately we're going to have to withdraw our job offer. Mm -hmm. so. so as a Canadian, it can be rather easy to work in the United States. You can, you can get a TN visa typically within, you know, a couple of weeks of getting a job offer. You have all the proper documentation, show up at port of entry. They, they stamp you in TN visa status and you're on your way. So as long as you do the due diligence ahead of time, you understand um, the proper qualifications for the position that you meet those qualifications and you found an employer to support you, then this can be a great opportunity and, and way to work in the United States for a long-term basis. Um, if you have any other questions about U.S. immigration law, let us know. Uh, tune into 
our next episode of the Arrive uh, U.S. Immigration podcast for Canadians. Check us out on on YouTube as well. And also, if you haven't, subscribe to our website, uh, to our resources blog, so you can get upcoming information on U.S. immigration law-related questions. Thank you for tuning in today, and have a great day.